Hello, everyone. This is JT Keating with Zimperium. I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to another webinar. This, uh, this webinar we're very excited about. Um, and as people start rolling in, as, uh, as Zoom allows everybody to roll in, uh, we're very excited about this because um, something a lot of folks have been you know, asking us about, especially in this kind of pandemic world, is there is such a thing as you know, webinar fatigue, you know, as we've replaced a lot of physical events um, with virtual events. And so one of the things we wanted to do is we wanted to actually um, have live demonstration and live um, showing capabilities and showing attacks and rather than just slay people with, with PowerPoint. I don't have any real empirical data to back up the fact that people would prefer that, but I think it's kind of common sense. So there's a couple of things that we're going to be doing here. Um, usual perfunctory uh, conversation, by the way, happy hamburger day. For some reason, today's happy hamburger day, which I think is fascinating. I think that should be every day, but you know, why not? Welcome everybody. Um, so we're going to try and make this about 30, 35 minutes uh, at, the, at the outset. Um, like I said, the majority of this whole thing is going to be a live demonstration with our experts. I'm going to introduce the experts here in a second. Um, uh, we will have an archived version of this up on the site um, probably later on today, if not by tomorrow, um, so people can actually come back and, and watch it again, um, which, is, which is great in case potentially you missed it uh, or missed something or you want to share it with your friends, we'll be able to, to do that. Um, we will have Q&A at the end. Please use the Q&A section or capability, not the chat capability. We've had some issues with chat in the past, and so if you have any questions, um, throw them in and we will address them um, either directly in the middle of it, if it's something I think would be uh, uh, helpful for everybody at the exact point in time or at the tail end. So with that, um, let, us, uh, let us dive in. And uh, we're going to be talking about mobile phishing and malware attacks. And I'm going to start off with the very few slides that you're going to see and actually talk about the data we've seen and the type of the nature of the, the threats hitting mobile um, in this new kind of pandemic remote work world. Um, and then we're going to turn it over and you're going to actually see this. Um, and the guys that are going to spend time with us on this, um, the experts in this, Ryan uh, Pringnitz um, is a senior consultant uh, in and around working uh, all things Workspace One. Uh, Ryan's also a great blogger, um, so you should definitely follow him on social media. Uh, so Ryan, thanks for, thanks for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's, it's going to be fun. And Ryan's going to be joined with uh, Kern Smith. And Kern is our VP of Sales Engineering here in America um, and a uh, dude that knows this space cold. So Kern, thanks for uh, spending some time with us as well. Always a pleasure, JT. Thanks for having me. Ah, great. These guys are excited because they're not going to have to listen to me for very long. But to start off with, Let's, let's hit some of this stuff. Um, clearly, as we all know, the world has changed overnight. We had a customer advisory board last, uh, last week and the, this, the data completely bears out the complete shift. It, it literally flip-flopped in terms of percentage of people that were working remotely before the pandemic and then going over now. Um, and then we also asked them, hey, by the way, and these are some of the biggest you know, global 1000 companies across all industries, all geographies, is this going away? And the answer is no. Um, it, it's not going to be maybe the same level. It won't be the same level that it is now. But it's not going back to pre-COVID days either. Um, matter of fact, one of the consistent themes we've seen from people is that productivity has actually increased across most folks. But so have attacks. And we have a blog that's on our site that you can go into this. Um, but this is just designed to frame up the demonstrations that the, the gents are about to go through. Here's what we've seen here at Imperium since, since the, uh, uh, the pandemic started. First, huge increase in the number of detected threats. Secondly, a major shift. Um, network attacks are a primary way to target um, companies. So network attacks have always been something that we've been detecting and remediating in a combination with Workspace ONE and Zimperium. Um, clearly, if you look at the maps now, instead of all these people connecting to Wi-Fi networks in, in tourist areas and in work areas, all of a sudden now everybody's scattered out in the suburbs. So not surprisingly, there's been a shift in location. There's also been a really interesting, in, in, interesting in a painful way, shift where 
mobile phishing has always has become the primary issue. Mobile malware, from a corporate standpoint, has not necessarily always been the biggest uh, risk factor. But now, when you look at the data and you look at what's happening, COVID-related phishing, COVID-related malware, um, risks in existing uh, legitimate apps that are focused on um, COVID are where the attacks are. So you can see huge numbers related to phishing, according to Google. Um, our own machine learning based engine, this is just an example, um, a bunch of malicious apps that were positioning themselves for people having to do with COVID-19 prevention. So trying to take advantage of people's concerns about these things, whether from a phishing standpoint to get them to click or whether it's from um, a, a, a malware standpoint. Primary themes are prevention, but also, and, and especially early, most of it was prevention, but also the other primary theme is the financial um, payments um, that people are getting from various different acts in different countries and phishing and malware in and around those. Um, just a couple other quick things so we can get to the, the fun part of this whole thing. Um, th this is just as of March, there was a, a if you know, few hundred removed from Google and Apple. We've seen a huge increase in side-loaded apps. Kern and uh, Ryan can be talking about this as well. And then I mentioned, even in legitimate apps that were designed by people to really solve COVID-19 related problems, there's been huge security and privacy risks that could be, that could be taken advantage of. So when it comes to um, mobile threat defense and why you need mobile threat defense and why we're heading towards unified endpoint security, combination of, of um, let's say for instance, Workspace ONE intelligence and Zimperium, Carbon Black and the VMware point, all of that sort of stuff. There's been straightforward things on some devices, but not really threat detection. So that's where Gartner came in and said, this is mobile threat defense. That's that category. And speaking of Gartner, for those folks that are familiar with Gartner, um, this is kind of part of their, their landscape um, where they basically say that mobile threat defense is equivalent to VPP slash EDR. Um, so when you look at when Kern and Ryan are now gonna take this and they're gonna go forward and show you capabilities, Zimperium is the mobile threat defense threat detection capability. Workspace ONE itself is the unified endpoint management piece. And they'll point to how we use that as a combination of detection from Zimperium, remediation and other actions from Workspace ONE. Um, and then as it goes forward, data like this goes directly into Workspace ONE intelligence along with data from VMware Carbon Black. And that's how you start to get into unified endpoint security. So PowerPoint over, me talking over, you guys now are very excited about this, I'm sure. And I am going to hand it over to Kern and Ryan. And gentlemen, if you could take it from here and now start to ex show us some of the stuff that we just got finished talking about, that would be awesome. Thanks, JT. So I uh, pr appreciate you kind of laying, laying the scene for us. And what I thought we'd start with is just kind of a conversation, you know, comparing notes between Ryan and I, um, you know, just what we're seeing out in the world. And Ryan, I know you've worked with, with a lot of, um, you know, large scale customers and stuff. And, and, you know, I think when a lot of people talk about, you know, securing mobile devices or, or securing, securing access, you know, automatically their mind kind of comes down, to, comes to MDM or VPN or things of that nature. So do you mind maybe kind of talking us through some of the approaches that you've seen customers leverage uh, with specifically within Workspace ONE to help secure these devices, uh, even specifically around say phishing attacks or, or attacks over the network potentially? Certainly. We've had clients, of course, look at uh, blacklisting applications, uh, preventing the installation of applications. We've had, uh, of course, clients look at leveraging uh, either a, a whole app, or rather a whole device VPN or a per app VPN for either a BYOD or a uh, work managed or, or corporate owned device. We've had um, identity and access management uh, become an increasingly important part of the conversation where uh, step up authentication can be required depending on the device, say network range or the, uh, the context uh, and, and where it stands in the world. Um, we've seen, uh, of course, um, you know, compliance policies to try and uh, react to different um, 
the scenarios that the device finds itself in, if it finds itself not in compliance with a certain uh, policy. We have DLP controls as well, uh, DLP, data loss prevention, to try and prevent the movement of data from say a uh, you know, work profile to a personal profile or a personal profile to a work profile. Um, you know, and we've, uh, we found those to be pretty effective. And then we've recently introduced Workspace ONE Intelligence, um, which we'll be talking about more in an upcoming webinar. Workspace ONE Intelligence, of course, being able to uh, uh, dynamically adjust the risk score for a user's identity and uh, allow the user to have the appropriate um, step up authentication um, uh, required when they're accessing more sensitive resources. Uh, we're all familiar maybe with restrictions uh, that can be placed on devices such as the uh, inability to or, or blocking the, uh, the user from installing applications or from say adding a account like a Google account or a, uh, a Dropbox kind of an account. So we have had controls that clients have been leveraging uh, in that capacity and, and um, they've been pretty successful. But uh, you know, we've, we found quite a bit of uh, interest in Zimperium and, and how that solution can complement our, um, our capabilities. So uh, Kern, what have you, uh, what have you seen clients do with uh, Zimperium? Yeah. And, uh, I, and adding to that. Yeah, no, I, I think kind of the critical thing is, and, and you hit on some things, is that traditionally most customers take uh, mutual, mutual or layered approaches, right? And, and you hit on a few things, right? Be it from uh, per app VPNs to full device VPNs, uh, you know, curating managed app lists, things, restrictions, things of that nature. The challenge that, you know, that's always arisen is that it doesn't seem to be there's a, a true gold standard around what the best approach is, right? Because, you know, one of the things that Workspace ONE does a great job of has having a lot of granularity within, say, multi-tenancy assignment groups. So you can have different flavors of management and policies going across the board. But, you know, within security, there's always that give and take of enablement versus uh, restrictions. So when you get into some scenarios, uh, typically you know, customers may not, um, may not have full visibility into all the ways that, um, that attackers may try to ingress the device, be it uh, via uh, corporate email, uh, personal email, uh, third party apps, things of that nature, specific on the phishing thing. You know, one of the things that, that I found interesting that you brought up, you know, a lot of people that I talk to say, well, what, what about VPNs, right? Be a per app VPN or, or a full device VPN, does that really address the challenge? And Ryan, I, I know you have some experience with how customers leverage kind of VPNs and environments. Maybe we can talk through some of the challenges or, or the use case that people are using those things within Workspace ONE. And then we can talk about how Workspace ONE plus Symporium really kind of help um, shore up the gaps in visibility or detection or prevention at that point. Certainly. Uh, there have been challenges with VPN adoption, uh, say for a, you know, a personal device that you've enrolled into your corporate environment, uh, you know, the sheer amount of, uh, of data, the bandwidth that's required to accommodate uh, the large amount of workers that are working remote now, it can be challenging even for some of the largest uh, network and telecommunication providers to accommodate the just sheer size of their workforce. Workforces that get into the 100,000 plus uh, you know, user um, or employee count. So with that many employees, it, it can be challenging to um, try and send or route all traffic back on premise to a uh, appliance that can perform, you know, packet inspection or uh, perform, you know, uh, basically, uh, you know, different levels of controls that other products may offer that, uh, that, could be beneficial, but to scale those those uh, controls, it can be difficult. So we've seen clients do per app VPNs, where the VPN is only used on a per application basis, not all the time, um, which can reduce some of the the bandwidth constraints that we've ha you know found customers having. But um, there there still could be room to improve, and um, and I think. Uh, you know, we, we can look at Zimperium maybe and how 
is Imperium doesn't necessarily require, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, Kern, but it doesn't require a whole app VPN back to on-premise to accomplish some of the some of its capabilities. Is that right? Correct. So what I want to do real quick is kind of show an example of some different attack scenarios that we've seen. And really the key thing on this is that with Workspace ONE in different scenarios, you know, first Workspace ONE becomes the enforcement mechanism. So it can mandate that you have something like Zimperium on the device to protect against a lot of different threats because then it becomes a part of a visibility, right? So using the management controls within Workspace ONE, you know, no different than you would restrict only managed devices from being able to access corporate email, you can then mandate that you have protection on the device through Zimperium. And then say, for example, a what we, one of the things we've seen is phishing uh, on the rise, you know, through either corporate persona or personal persona. So in this case, Ryan, you're, you're gracious enough to, to send this to me earlier. There's a, a video of a phishing email that's coming through, uh, say, a corporate, uh, corporate container. I think this is the, uh, bo the boxer. Um, email, email, but fundamentally what most organizations don't have is visibility if somebody clicks on one of these links that is really trying to social engineer the uh, user and with zips being mandated by workspace one and using the on device phishing detection capabilities, we're able to mutually pr both provide access securely through workspace one and prevent the potential exfiltration of credentials or exposure to the user because really phishing attacks kind of boil down to two different things. It's either I'm trying to get something from the user or I'm trying to put something onto the device. So this is where we can mandate that, but it's not just the things that are coming over the personal side, it, oh, sorry, the work side. It's also the things that are coming from the personal side from a user perspective. So being able to say to a user, look, we don't want to route all of your traffic through corporate servers, but if you get a personal email that says, hey, you need to review this, otherwise you're not going to get paid, most, cust most users are going to uh, you know, click on this. And Ryan, I think we were talking about it earlier. You know, what, there was a, a company that recently did a pen test on, on their users and what, what was the percentage of people that clicked on an exact link like this just in a test scenario? I think it was something like 10 to 20% and uh, very recognizable, very tech savvy individuals, but the, uh, the phishing attacks are, are just more and more convincing in what they're trying to sell. You know, your track is, excuse me, your package is being tracked. Click here for the uh, location of your package. It may be out for delivery, COVID-19. Maybe you need to sign up for, uh, for testing or, or assign an acceptable use or a uh, return to work policy where you, acknowledge that you need to change some of your behaviors at work uh, to ensure the safety of everybody at work. And these are very convincing messages that appear harmless and even the mm -hmm. best and the brightest fall victim here. And um, Kern, I'll let you go ahead and give the demo here where we have a link that looks like it might be malicious. Absolutely. And, and this is where this type of scenario becomes really nefarious because these communications aren't even coming through corporate controls, right? So, but they're still targeting the user from a corporate persona. So as a user, if I, if I did not have the ability to detect with zips through Workspace ONE to say, hey, this is malicious, I really would fall victim to these things. But it's not just the email aspect, it's also personal apps that we're seeing uh, things coming from uh, targeted attacks coming through that again are still trying to target either the corporate persona or whatnot. So uh, an example of this is a link that's sent over WhatsApp. Again, because Workspace ONE can enforce that Zips is on the device and enables these type of detections, we're just showing phishing at this point, we're able to even protect the personal side, uh, much less the corporate side of, of, the, of those attacks. But in this instance, we're just showing kind of phishing from a perspective of just links. But as we talked about, the other aspect of this that we're seeing is, isn't just somebody trying to grab credentials from a user, but it's also the perspective of them trying to put something onto the device, you know, to try to then get something else from the device. So your traditional malware attack. And, and Ryan, uh, you know, maybe talk to me, can, can you talk to me about some of the challenges or controls that you've seen customers put in around say malware within Workspace ONE or some of the challenges that they've, tr that they've traditionally run into with that? 
Yeah, some of the challenges, you know, we, we of course have DLP controls that we can put in place. We have uh, compliance policies which can act when uh, certain conditions are met. We uh, of course can um, uh, try and blacklist applications reactively. So uh, we don't know all applications that we need to blacklist, of course, so we can do our best to, uh, to blacklist the known malicious applications um, workspace one intelligence, I think, as we had touched on previously, that is a, um, a part of our um, identity and access management uh, solution where we are able to dynamically adjust the risk score for a user's identity and uh, require, for instance, step up authentication. So multi factor authentication can be, uh, it can be leveraged at that time. So uh, some of those examples, I think, um, I kind of start the conversation there. Um, any questions, uh, Kern, about uh, maybe some areas that I can expand on or other curiosities? No, I, I think you know you hit the you hit the nail on the head. I mean, right now it's kind of a manual process, and this is where you know traditionally what I've seen is is many customers using say compliance policies or saying, hey we saw something in the news, you can't have this version of the app on there. But one of, one of the other aspects is, you know, it becomes a very static thing. So what, what helps is when Symperium and, work, and Workspace One kind of work together to create a more dynamic detection environment. So in this instance, right, what we can do is we can integrate again with Workspace One where mandating zips is on the device, but also using compliance policies to say, hey, if something bad has been put onto the device, we're gonna revoke access to corporate items. So in this case, we're pushing down workspace and, the co and content to this device. But say if the user gets a email uh, from uh, on their personal side that tries to put a malicious or suspicious application onto the, onto the device, this zips would be able to detect this and the, and the risk that that malicious application has is that especially when you think about um, the way mobile is used within most enterprises uh, most mobile devices become a second factor of authentication even for the enterprise persona so if you think of things like authenticator being pushed down to the device or sms authentication or second factor coming over email well a lot of malware now is using covid uh, and the covid situation to prompt the user to, to put the malware onto the device. And then what they do is they start trying to do, say, overlay attacks or trying to read SMS messages or any number of things to get at that second factor of authentication that's being localized on the mobile device. So what we can do is the combination of Zimperium on the device can detect that suspicious application. And then using compliance policies, in conjunction with uh, Workspace ONE, we can then tell Workspace ONE to automatically remove or revoke corporate access so that things like the second factor of auth are, no, are not available. And you see here, we've removed the Workspace app and the content app from the device. And then as the user goes and remediates the threat, because this is coming in this instance on the personal side, um, the we can then remove the app and automatically with the compliance policies uh, within Workspace ONE, reprovision access to the device. So you now see Zip says the device is safe, there's no malicious apps on the device, et cetera. We now see that uh, in this instance, works, the Workspace app is now being pushed back down to the device. And then automatically without the user having to do anything or check back in or any of that type of stuff or the admins having to do anything, they're now reprovisioned and re-authenticated. So really when you talk about kind of the two scenarios that we're seeing with uh, attackers, you know, leveraging the COVID situation where they're either trying to get uh, data from the device with traditional phishing attempts that are targeting mobile devices, both over the corporate side and the personal side of the house, but also attempts to put malware on the device to then uh, get the user to install something on the device to then target the device first things like second factor of auth we really are able to provide a valuable uh, combination of, of solutions to a automate the deployment of the detection and mandate the deployment of zips on the device in conjunction with workspace one but then with the integration from a compliance perspective leveraging things like these compliance policies to say if simperium has detected something bad is taking place on the device automatically revoke corporate access 
until that malware in this instance has been removed from the device. So I'll kind of pause right there. Yeah. Sorry, Kern. I was going to say, I know we have a lot of questions coming in the, uh, the chat, but I want to ask a few questions too to, to just kind of uh, make sure everybody's aware of some of the options that we have here. So everything we, uh, we have here is configurable. It's not like it's one way only to or one solution, one action that can be taken. The compliance policy you have in front of us, of course, this can be configured as appropriate the messages that we had seen earlier when we had a phishing, um, attempted phishing uh, attack, uh, that was, everything was configurable, right? So it's, it's configured as your corporation or as your, your uh, policies dictate or, or are required to be set, right? So nothing is, is set in stone, in other words. You can configure it to your organization's needs. So you don't need to necessarily block all of your applications. You can configure the appropriate response, the appropriate messaging, notifications. Absolutely. Is that right? Absolutely. And I think the, that speaks to the power of the granularity of detection, but also more importantly, the granularity of, of Workspace ONE and the way that you can manage different policies and different compliance actions. Really, customers are able to configure responses based off of however they would like to, um, their use case, right? So how they treat corporate devices versus BYO devices versus uh, other aspects, you know, be it uh, from, a, from a use case perspective, but also from a privacy perspective, the, the solutions really have like minds as far as that ability to configure those policies based off of the demands of the business and the user. So with that, uh, JT, maybe we'll kind of hand it over to you uh, for uh, the Q&A uh, portion of things. That's perfect. Thank you guys very much. Um, and as, uh, as everybody, we do have some questions that have already come in and I'll start facilitating them. Um, if you have questions, uh, please feel free to put them in. Uh, we did have one question right at the, um, at the onset uh, asking about the link to Ryan's blog, um, which I said, as I told you, is a, is a very good blog. Um, we will send in the follow-up emails to this, we'll send the link to that blog along with the link to our blog. Um, so those are great sources for, for any mobile security uh, piece of information. So with that, um, let's, start, uh, let's start diving in. Um, the first question we had, uh, and it wasn't clear whether he was talking about Zimperium or whether he was talking about Workspace ONE. Um, so you guys can both answer uh, quickly, if you will. Um, what kind of servers and apps need to be prepared to deploy the solution on-prem? Yeah, so, uh, you know, both both solutions, you know, I, 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 and, and Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong, but Workspace ONE uh, can can be deployed on-prem as, as can Zimperium. I would say that it depends on the, the scope and scale that goes on to it. So, you know, I'd love to kind of have a direct follow-up, but both solutions do support uh, on-premise deployments and then, you know, further details can be provided, you know, kind of based off of the customer's requirements and, and scope and, and uh, needs at that point. So I'd love to, you know, follow up uh, with that individual directly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. I can add real quick. Yeah, we have uh, SaaS tenants available, of course, for Workspace ONE in addition to uh, uh, myself running my own labs and Azure GCP, Google Cloud, in addition to AWS. So you can even run labs uh, in that capacity as well. So very flexible with our options. Perfect. Um, there's a question about supported operating systems um, today, Android and iOS, and that is today. Um, and then the lowest versions of Android and iOS that are supported by Zips, Kern? That's a good question. I've got, I've got to check. I, let me actually check in, in the uh, public app stores to see what's officially listed, uh, but I'll, I'll get back to you on that one. Okay, yeah, That's we've got, yeah. Um, we've got the information of folks that uh, yeah. are asking the questions. That'll be on an exam question coming up, by the way, guys. <laughs> I, I know, I, I, feel like, I feel like I'm failing a pop quiz at the moment. <laughs> All right, well, I'm gonna give you another one, Kern. You got yeah. another chance to redeem yourself. Um, does Zips require rooting or jailbreaking? Uh, unequivocally, no, it does not. Uh, Zips is just a app that sits on the device. Um, so it does not require any advanced permissions uh, or any, you know, jailbreaking jailbreaking or rooting of the device um you know in fact when you have mdm on the device the mdm actually has more access to data and capabilities on the device than than zips would 
But that's really where the power of the combined solution comes into play, being able to leverage Workspace One's management capabilities and MDM rights potentially on, on the device, or even uh, MAM controls or, or UEM, however you want to frame it, in combination with, with ZIP's detection really shores up different gaps in visibility uh, for, um, for enterprises that, the, you know, around not just the security of the device, which Workspace One kind of enforces stack security controls, but, you know, ZIPs can go, go over the top of it to, make, to gain visibility if somebody's either trying to bypass the security controls from an attack perspective or identify certain risks that may uh, drive organizations to maybe tweak how they manage the devices going forward from a, from a control perspective. I'll add to that real quick. Uh, Workspace One or the Hub, our agent would be acting as a device owner in the context of an Android use case. And um, essentially, you wouldn't be able to remove that uh, management agent from the device. And the Zips or Zimperium agent would be interacting with our, our uh, device owner uh, application known as Hub. Perfect. Um, so here's another uh, line of questioning. Um, does Zips analyze user data? <laughs> Great question. Um, the answer is no. Uh, when you look at user data, you know, the, some examples that kind of commonly come to mind are, you know, text messages, photos, the content of applications, you know, those type of things. I, unequivocally, Zimperium does not analyze, analyze any of that or look, look at that. It's really, it's focus is around the system itself and if there's anything that uh, could expose the user to attacks so when you think about it, it's actually it's actually focuses around protecting the user in the organization rather than analyzing uh, the user themselves and then on top of that you have different privacy control options about what data is or is not sent from the device as part of a forensic package which again you can customize on different group bases very similar to the controls that are in workspace one around uh you know corporate owned devices versus BYO, those type of things. So it's very, you know, basically if you have, if you have Workspace One going uh, in there, Zimperium is not looking at any, is not looking at any additional data that it's, is not already capable of being looked at by Workspace One, typically. GDPR compliant as well, is that correct? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. In fact, we're looking to protect that information that is very sensitive and personal to you, uh, whether it be with Workspace One or Zimperium. So we're not looking to look at the data, just protect the data. So a few questions that are kind of along these lines. And, and, and folks, we're going to run through a few more of these questions. Um, hopefully, they'll be of interest to you. Um, uh, you know, and then the ones we can't get to, obviously, we can, um, we can respond to folks back directly um, offline. Um, but it's again, there's a couple things that have to do with the, the whole end user component here. Two questions that are related to, to the personal work, you know, kind of thing and the end users. Um, the specific question was, um, is, uh, is any end user action required to enable anti-phishing protection or is it deployed silently and automatically? It depends on the configurations that, that are out there, but there are certain configurations that can be pushed that can enable the silently other configurations may involve a user interaction. It, it, it depends on the use case and the device type that, that's, that's out there, basically. But there are some different uh, capabilities depending on the use case. We so the up. answer is kind of, it depends, <laughs> I guess, is the best way I can answer that. If you'd like to provide your information, though, we could set up a demonstration or try and discuss your use case in further detail to make sure we can uh, understand your needs and make sure that they're, uh, all your questions are, are answered. Yeah, that's, a, that's exactly right, Ryan. And as a matter of fact, we had a few folks um, in the question section um, that first of all gave you guys accolades um, for a great session. Um, and a few folks specifically asked for um, the ability to do demonstrations and POCs. Um, so I think that is perfect. Um, another uh, quick question, um, if malicious app is detected, is the admin able to remotely remove it from a mobile device? Uh, again, uh, kind of depends on the use case. So, you know, ultimately the administrator is, you know, the, the administrator of the device is the user. So for example, on iOS, uh, and those familiar with, you know, uh, MDM controls, you, even with MDM uh, controls on the device, you can't remove uh, an app from the device. It, it kind of becomes an all or nothing thing. You either uh, prevent access to the Apple App Store or, which is an all or nothing approach, you know, in most, <clears throat> in kind of the most generic use cases. So, 
really from a management perspective, it's very similar to what to controls that most companies already put in place. Uh, the device must be managed a to get access to corporate content. And if the device comes out of compliance for whatever reason, be it uh, detection triggered by zips or maybe other compliance rules within Workspace ONE, uh, you then revoke access to corporate data um, from the device until the device comes back into compliance. Now, there's other, you know, specific use cases with other OEMs. So, for example, uh, Samsung with Knox capabilities. I know Workspace ONE has some different capabilities on there along with some Perium that, you know, again, in combination can actively remove uh, malware automatically from the device. But it's, again, it's going to be use case dependent based on the operating system platform uh, more than anything else. That is, uh, that is perfect. Well, guys, we are, um, we are uh, over time. Um, folks, I apologize. There's some questions we have not had a chance to, to get to, but we do know who asked them, so we can actually uh, respond back to you folks directly. Um, there was uh, one last question, which I'm going to address with a little bit of a teaser. Um, and that was, uh, I heard mention of integration between Superium, Workspace ONE, and Carbon Black. Do you have more details on that um, and how those interact and complement each other? Um, we have a blog that's up called Unified Endpoint Security um, that was, that's been up um, for since March that explains it at a high level. Um, and the only other thing I'll say is stay tuned. Um, ask me that question again by the tail end of next week, um, and you'll have, uh, you'll have some, some pretty interesting uh, insights into that particular question. Um, so with that, I would like to uh, thank Ryan and Kern for a great session. Thank you guys very, very much. Um, I also would like to uh, uh, throw an offer out um, to anybody um, that if any part of what we talked about here is of interest to you, and particularly if you really want to know about, hey, look, especially in this COVID world with phishing going nuts and malware going nuts, I want to talk to somebody about how do I actually get my customer, get my users protected as quickly as possible. Just shoot me an email. Um, shoot me an email at JT dot Keating, K-E-A-T-I-N-G, at Zimperium.com. And there's some folks that already asked for demonstrations and the questions, and we'll, we'll get to you um, specifically. But anybody else, send me an email, jt.keating at Zimperium.com, um, and I will uh, facilitate that and get you guys set up with the, the appropriate folks. So with that, um, like I said, uh, Ryan, Kern, thank you guys very much for this session. It's been fantastic. Really, really appreciated you guys uh, and what you showed us. Thank you very much, JT. Appreciate it. Anytime. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Take Absolutely. Care. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.